At what point did they approach you about doing this uh, B-29 mission? Well, let me, they, they, nobody approached me, uh, Kermit, I got to tell you that. I was flying for Jimmy Doolittle, and Arnold sent a message to General Doolittle that he wanted the most experienced field grade officer to come back to the United States and get on a B-29 airplane. Mm -hmm. And Doolittle called me into his office. He said, I don't know anything about this B-29, but he said, they want you, and you're the most experienced man we got at the moment, huh. as far as... Uh, were you familiar with the fact that there even was a B-29? No, I never knew it. I never knew it. Really? That. So it was a, a still basically top they they, secret? They, or? Yeah, they didn't do a lot of publicity on that airplane at that particular time. I think when Eddie Allen got killed, it opened up the box. Yeah, and he was, the, uh, when, he was the test pilot for Boeing. He was also the, the project engineer. He hmm. was not only the test pilot, he was the engineer. And when they lost that airplane, they lost all of their B-29 experience. Right, and how, what was the cause of that accident? He, he had an engine on fire and he tried to make it back into Boeing Field and crashed about a half a quarter of a mile from the end of the runway into a meat packing plant. Yeah. And as I remember, a lot of the early B-29s, there were engine fire problems. That's, and, that's right, yeah. well anyway, uh, that, was, that was the uh, thing that caused me to go back. When I got back there, I had, uh, my order said Wichita, Kansas. Well, they stopped me before I got to Wichita because Boeing had said they were not going to build the B-29 airplane. Hmm. It was too much trouble, there were too many things wrong with it and all of those sorts of things. Really? The argument was, well, we just don't want to build it because we've got all these problems. The military, the government said to them, look, we've already given you $50 million, you want to give it back to us? <laughs> we'll give it to some other manufacturer for an airplane. And that's, they, I think, when they got Vic Agatha involved to well, yeah, I see, I, based on my peculiar ex position, yeah, I got involved in a lot of damn things that were really none of my business, but I picked them up on the side. Mm -hmm. I had to pick them up because I was flying people around that had to listen. And on the basis of that, why, the, uh, the uh, government said, you will build the B-29. Boeing says, fine, we will run the factory, but we will take no responsibility. Hmm. Hap Arnold said, we will take the responsibility. You build the damn airplanes, that's what we want. I'll be done. Well, okay. I went to Wichita, Kansas, and when I got there, there was a man by the name of K.B. Wolf there. He was from Wright, uh, Wright Field now. Remember mm -hmm. Wright Patterson? Wright, Wright. and Patterson are, are now one, but they were two different places. Mm -hmm. And Wright Field was a technical place. In Dayton, Ohio. Uh, K.B. Wolf was a good man on, on, on airplane production and engines and everything else. He knew what he was doing. He had a task force out there, and that was why I reported it uh, in the... Uh, uh, hangar of <laughs> Boeing's factory, the so-called test hangar, right there. I got, I was there, and he, Wolf, hmm. gave all of these guys that he knew by their first name, gave them their assignments. He looked at me, he said, what are you supposed to do? He was, a, he was a one star at that time. I said, General, I'm supposed to fly airplanes. He said, okay, there's 13 YBs sitting out there, go fly one of the damn things. So were you the next guy after Eddie Allen to fly the B-29? That's I'll right. Be darn. Yeah. He huh. said, and you basically he, had to teach yourself. I taught myself to fly it, which to me, okay, it was another airplane. It wasn't that mysterious, uh -huh. but I didn't know how to start the engines. I didn't know anything about that power plant in the back. But there was a man in the factory who had made one flight as an assistant engineer with Boeing, and I got a hold of him. I said, do you know how to start the engines? I said, he said, yes, I do. I said, fine, we'll, we'll go fly this thing. And I found the scanners for the rear end, and I found a co-pilot, a major running loose there, and I grabbed him and he said, you're going to fly with me. He said, I've never been in one. I said, I'm either, but we're going to fly one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good deal. <laughs> now, anyway. at this point, did you know that your purpose and the mission was going to be the Japan No, flight? I did not know anything, because I'm, I'm still talking 19, 1943. Okay. And I didn't get this command job until September of 43. So yeah, I'm talking it? really... Of course, ultimately the, the mission was in 1945, so we're still a couple of years away. Yeah, we got to get we got to get a little further, and then I I, I got I was assigned to Eglin, mm -hmm. uh, Eglin Field, as a project guy for all kinds of things. I had to run the tests on the on YBs for the engine mods, uh, for developing different types of flaps, mm -hmm. uh, not that is engine cowling mm. flaps. So you spent uh, a significant amount of time, probably a year or so at least, in the development of the B-29. I got, I got, I got over a thousand hours doing it. Okay, that's interesting. And then and, at what point and time period did they approach you well, okay, about let's, the... Well, let's, okay, uh, let's take it one step, and that is let's go to 
Almogordo, New Mexico, okay, where yeah. they're having a test. Testing, yeah. University of New Mexico. The physics department there got a contract with the Air Force, Air Corps, I say Air Force, Air Corps, intermixed. Uh, they got a contract to determine the vulnerability of a B-29 to fighter attack. Mm -hmm. Dr. E.J. Workman, who headed their physics department, was the project officer. I was sent there to assist and do anything that I could. And they had a they had a B-29 there that uh, I call it, you know, one of those old tired ones. And uh, it had been used for everything that you can imagine. And it broke on them on a critical day. Hmm. I had flown there from Grand Island, Nebraska. And when I got there from Grand Island, Nebraska, that was a different reason. I was going to be Frank Armstrong's uh, director of, of uh, the training for the purpose of turning out B-29 pilots, mm -hmm. instructor pilots. Well, anyway, uh, when I got when I got to and got this to a witch store and got this thing squared away with enough people to put in the airplane, I told the, the uh, man that was, I don't remember names, but I told him, I said, you start the engine, let me watch what you're doing. And so he started them up one, two, three, four, like you're supposed to do it. And I thought, that's pretty good. Well, of course, we're sitting there with a the myelin and they get all hot. He said, you can't, knock. I forgot what it was. I think it was something like 310 on cylinder heads was, too, was terrible. Oh, yeah, you weren't supposed hot. to be there. Yeah. Well, anyway, I was looking at them, and while we're talking about it, I don't think I ever took one off with a lower than 300. I'll be darned. Yeah, huh. that was the, you wouldn't get mm. off the ground if, if that was the case. Of course, mm. Kansas is very hot in the summertime. Okay, so you're out now okay, in Magorda. Okay, we go off. I run, I run a couple of dry runs down the runway as far as I think I can go and still stop, just to try to get the field of the airplane. I lifted the wheels off on the second trip, because uh, the first one felt fine. It was just an airplane. I got the feeling of the ailerons acting a little bit on the wings. But anyway, I knew at that time, I, so we went back, cooled the engines down, and I told him, I said, okay, this time we're going for broke. We're going right off at the end of the runway. And uh, we did. It flew just as fine and nice as anything could be. And I, I must have played with it for about 30 minutes. Now, of course, I couldn't do things. I couldn't do climbing and descending and do all that sort of stuff. I had to maintain level flight. Mm -hmm. And I dipped the nose to see how it picked up speed. I, I'd hold pull the nose up to see how fast it bled it off and mm -hmm. one thing. I just trying to get used to the yep, feel of the feel airplane. For it, yeah. And I did. The airplane was gentle. It there was nothing hmm. peculiar about hmm. it. It did what you expected it to do based on the way you were handling it. Hmm. And I, I thought, gee, this is a great airplane. Right. And uh, one one time in this period of of doing this I had a I had a blister bro out on me in the back, and I didn't know what the hell happened because the cockpit filled full of snow. It was something different. And that was that was when it was under pressure. Yes, when it was pressurized. Yeah. Yeah. Of it, course, then you get the condensation. The plastic, and the plastic in those days wasn't what came later. Yeah. Because yeah. they blew out frequently. Yeah. I they had they one, lost gunners too out of the. Side I know that. I had there. one blow on me, and as I say, the first thing I thought was somebody hit me in the head with the back of a pillow. I'll be. Done. Bang! You know, my neck went down huh. that way. Then everything was just snowed inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be and done. Landing in the tunnel was ripped out and all that hmm. kind of business. So but, well, so so when did you get into the the, the Manhattan Project as far okay. as the, the bomb? Okay, I learned a lot of things in this test with and particularly when the New Mexico test where they had this thing against the fighter. I learned the thing that I learned was if I had a lightweight airplane which I had flown there, mm -hmm. that I could get higher than they could. They couldn't catch me. Uh -huh. I learned that. When and you I say high, you could get higher than the Japanese fighters could fly. That's right. Well, anyway. We and had what two, altitude was that? Well, we, we were flying at 25,000 feet, but I had it on autopilot, and I was, oh, I was fascinated with all this dido cut by these fighter pilots, you see. They were doing slow rolls in front of me and behind me and all, everything like that. And I said, boy, well, the next thing I hear on the radio, tell him to slow down. Really? My engine's overheating. I can't catch him. And I looked. I was at 31,000 feet. It had drifted up to 31. Really? And so I, I put that in the back of my head. If I can get up, if I can get over 30,000 feet, I don't have to worry about those Japs. Uh, fine, let's skip from there and go right on. In that test time, I got a call from uh, Colorado Springs, the office of General UGN, Commander General Second Air Force. His was the training Air Force. I belonged to him by reason of being assigned to Frank Armstrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had been sent there, as I say, to help Dr. Workman do what I could. Uh, and Okay, with that, then, Next thing that happened to me, I go to see General Ent, and when I get to see him, uh, there are four people in his office uh, besides himself. Uh, 
One of them was uh, Captain Navy Captain Parsons. Uh, the other was uh, Dr. Ramsey. There were only three people. And the third one was a man by the name of Lieutenant Colonel by the name of Barks. Uh, uh, yeah, Bark. Okay. He was the head of the Manhattan Security District. And he wanted to talk to me and ask questions because they had uh, investigated uh, 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 I, We know that as the yeah. Manhattan Project. Yeah, so anyway, yeah. the Manhattan Project. And he, at that time, told General Ed, he, he questioned me on a couple of things, and, and uh, he was pretty close. And uh, so he told General Ed, we approve of him, meaning me. And with that, then Dr. Ramsey was called to, to tell me what they were doing about building the bomb and how it was being built, what they expected it to do, and that sort of thing. And what that, time period was this? Well, it's uh, 44? It was middle, middle of September of, of uh, 44, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, uh, the next thing that comes along in that same sequence is that uh, I am told to go look at different places to find out. They gave me a B-29 squadron, 393rd bomb hmm. squadron, General Lint did. He said, I've done all these things for you, but that's all I can do. Hmm. I don't know what you're supposed to now, do. Now, in the middle of 44, had they detonated the first test yet? No. They had not done it. No, that. they had not. But anyway, they were looking. What, they, what I learned over the time was that those men that were doing all of this projecting of things that would happen, they happened just the way they projected them even though they'd never seen it done, but they, they, right, that's, right, they were the type right. of people. They are testing the, the nuclear so anyway, yeah. theories and stuff. And on the basis of that, why, I, uh, uh, I got my, I got my, I selected wind over Utah, I checked the B-29 squadron, they was good as anybody, because I knew already that what little bit of training they had had, and they had had half of their combat crew training, but I knew they weren't going to be able to fly and do what I wanted to do. Right. And I just said, I'll take anything there, you know, with any basic experience, I'll get them to Wendover, we'll teach them a few things. Hmm. And I always get a big kick out of that because they did get to Wendover. And when I got to talking to them, I told them that they were going to, they were going to fly the airplane at 25,000 feet. They were going to drop bombs from 500 pound uh, bombs, practice bombs from 25,000 feet. And their aiming point would be, I think, 25 uh, feet in diameter. They and thought you were crazy. I said, I want you to put them in that damning point. They said, you can't do it. <laughs> I, so well, so you were involved in quite a bit in the training of B-29 yeah. crews, too. I, I laid it out, yeah. Oh, that's great. So at what point did they say, okay, we've got a mission to do this, and they picked you for the, for the bomb drop? Well, look, this is what people don't understand. That's why I'm giving you a lot of verbiage. They told me it's all your responsibility. We can't tell you what to do. You oh, do really? it. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. That and, was it. And what were you there what? at the testing of the of the bomb or No, I was not there when they fired the bomb. I had gone there because I wanted to fly an airplane near the vicinity of the explosion to see what the effect was. Right. But the weather had to, they had to cancel out on the first test. By the same token, my outfit was sitting on Tinian and they had problems out there. Everybody right. wanted to take everything they had away from them. Yeah. And I had to go out and protect the integrity of my outfit. Huh. And, uh, now, had you picked the airplane at this point, the Enola Gay? Yes. That, that, that takes us back a little bit. When these airplanes were in the production line, we knew what we were going to do. I was going to remove all of the armament except the tail guns. Right. I wanted all the armor played out except around the tail gunner. So you were trying to lighten the airplane up as much Seven, as possible? 7,200 pounds really? took out of each one of them. How much higher did that enable you to fly above a normal B-29? 7,000 feet. Oh, boy. And so because of the speed and the altitude, you felt you didn't... Of course, I had fuel-injected engines, and I had Curtis Revec reversible props. They had a different right. deal on mm -hmm. those, and they were good. Those airplanes right. were just as good as... Good. Well, as possible to make them uh, from what they started mm -hmm. out to be. And on the basis of that, here I am, as I say, I got, I got that outfit out there. And so I turned around and went back to Tinian. And the bomb was exploded, but I had an observer there, one of my pilots uh -huh. from the 393rd was there. And he came out with Parsons, and they had photographs. And we showed the group, the operations part of the group, we showed all of them the photographs, and never used the word atom. We just said, right. this is going to be a powerful bomb. Really? And that sort of thing. Huh. Well, how, how, how did, what, what's, the, what's the story behind the name, the Enola Gay? All right, you've got to go clear back. <laughs> to, to Miami, Florida, if you want to be truthful about it, in 1934. I was a student at the University of Cincinnati at that time. Uh -huh. And uh, 
I told my dad at that time that I wanted to go fly airplanes instead of being a doctor. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me, he said, okay. He said, you be on your own. If you want to go kill yourself, I don't give a damn. Go ahead. <laughs> my mother looked at me, said, Paul, if you want to fly airplanes, you go ahead. You'll be all right. And so her probably, name... Probably had some intuition on that. Yeah. Her name was Enola Gay. Your mother. And my mother's mm -hmm. name. And nobody had ever heard that. And any time they were introduced, they said, where did that name come from? And she said, I don't know. And, and your mother was still alive at the time of the end of the oh, war. Oh yeah, my mother so. was living right here on Southwest Sixth Street when I dropped the bomb in Miami. Huh? In Miami, yeah. My dad was dealing in property and stuff like that, and he had a he had a, an apartment in, on Southwest Sixth Street. He had a garage apartment, which is where he and my mother lived. My sister had been married and gone, uh -huh. and I'm gone into the military, so uh -huh. it was yeah. natural for them. Yeah. And uh, okay, so now we're back to the bomb. Okay. With that uh, deal, I was had to go through. I didn't have to, but I went through the factory as my airplanes were coming off the line mm -hmm. and watching. Now, they were not you, one behind the other. Now, when you say your airplanes, these are the airplanes for your group. For the crew, but you had silver plate out, airplanes. You had picked out your specific airplane for the mission. Uh, silver plate airplanes. I ordered fifteen brand new B 29s I didn't want anything the training command had been using or anybody else. I wanted new, new airplanes. Ones, yeah, and uh, I knew that there was enough things had been done to them. I also knew what I was going to have done to them, right. which was I was going to have fuel-injected engines on them because my roommate at, at uh, Kelly Field was up there in Wright Field, and he called me one day. He said, Paul, I don't know what you're doing, but he said, you're getting 15 new B-29s out of the Martin plant at Omaha. I said, fine. I'm glad to hear that. Didn't know where they're coming from. He said, would you like to have fuel-injected engines on them? I said, I sure would. Would you like to have Curtis reversible pitch props? You know, it was yeah, 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 it yeah. was break energy in, yeah, in, yeah. In, inefficient on stopping at a heavy airplane. I said I sure would. He said, "Okay, I thought you would." He said, "I've already had 50 sets of them sent to Martin Omaha. They're going to go on your airplane." 50 sets of propellers, huh? 50, right. 50 sets of propellers and engines. Right. Four times each, with spares, because hmm. I only had 15. Yeah, of course the the B29 had the uh, right 3350, and it was 2,200 horsepower. Well. Yeah, they were running, they were, I don't know what we had on those fuel-injected engines. I never worried about horsepower because one thing that happened with fuel injection engines, you got enough fuel into all of the cylinders that they didn't get so damn hot. Yeah. And that's what, that's what I was after. Yeah, and you had had the experience before of having the overheated oh, yes. I'd had prototypes. Ex yeah. I'd had experience mm -hmm. with that. And uh, with this, with that uh, situation, I was in the Martin plant at, uh, it was, you know, it was just off of the edge of Offutt Field, and I was in that plant. Uh, I don't know what I was doing there. Of course, somebody in the plant that represented the Air Force was somebody I knew, and I just would walk through there to check with him and uh, in his office to see where my airplanes were. And I went out into where the production line had ended and where flight tests took place. And this one of the civilian supervisors there said, I don't know what you're doing, but he said, do you want a good airplane? I said, yeah. He said, that one right there, 4486292. He said, that one went through factory test without a write-up. The Air Force accepted it without a write-up. That's really? a good airplane. Awesome. I said, fine. So 4486292 put in my computer. And when it was ready for delivery from the factory in uh, June of uh, 45, really? I, yeah. had, uh, I had huh. my co-pilot who was going to fly with me. I had him go get it because he was a qualified pilot. I had him go pick it up and bring it to, to hmm. Wendover. And, and when uh, did uh, when did Enola Gay go on the side? Well, Enola Gay went on to it the night, the afternoon of the night before we took off. Took because, off on the raid? Yeah, on the raid. Oh, okay, off a team. And the reason was most everybody had an airplane named after a yeah. girlfriend or a town or mm -hmm. anything else. I didn't, I thought maybe that that airplane would be famous, famous someday. And I didn't want a duplication of names on a B-29. I didn't want an obscene name on a B-29. Right. So I talked to the crew. I said, anybody got an idea they want a name on the airplane? They all looked at me, you know, like I didn't know what I was talking about. I said, and I talked, I think it was Tom. I said, Tom, you got anything? No. Dutch? Tom, Tom is the bombardier, Tom yeah. Farabee. Farabee. And I said to Dutch, you got any? He said, no, you got one. And Dutch said, I said, yeah. I said, well, put the name on. What are you going to call it? I said, Enola Gay. And they looked at me in amazement and said, yeah, that's different. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it became an Gay that, that evening. 